Hi guys. Um, yeah, so welcome. Um, first of all, really difficult times, so I hope everyone's safe and your loved ones are well. Um, that's, that's the most important thing. Right, so I've got the Saturday night slot and we're going to talk about stats, which to me sounds like a tough sell, but hopefully together we're going to have a good time. What are we going to cover today then? So, okay, rough outline. We're going to talk about the problem with stats, first of all. Um, and to be fair, Doug, Doug Reed did a lot of my work for me. So Doug, Doug wrote a really good article a few days ago, um, which, which got me thinking about that. So first of all, we'll cover the problem with stats. We'll briefly talk about um, where I first came across the packing metric, um, its history, and we'll look at some specific futsal examples, some clips. It's important to know where it fits into, into a bigger universe, and, and that was covered by Ben yesterday, so I'll, I'll show it in context of that. Um, we need to look pragmatically at what we can achieve each week um, after, after a game's finished, within a normal training week and before the next game, so that's the pragmatic scope bit. Uh, then we're going to look at some team and some player examples from NFS Tier 1, and uh, we're definitely going to look at some of Doug's stats as well. Um, and we're, we're going to look at the importance of context, um, how it's important to question everything, and, and we can't just blindly accept what the stats would suggest. So that's, that's kind of the overview, so drop questions into the chat um, whenever, and I'll, I'll try and keep pace with them. So the first, first part of it really, um, this, is, this is quite an old reference, so I apologise. Freakonomics, it's been around for ages, um, but I, I like the page, Who Cheats? And just about everyone. So I, I like this quote here at the bottom, hopefully you can see the mouse. Um, for every person that goes to the trouble of creating an incentive scheme, or in, in this case, some sort of analytics, there's always an army of people um, who spend time trying to beat the system. And that happens in all walks of life, whether that's um, industry, business, whether that's sport. So I've got two examples here. So the first example is, is a business one, or rather it's a hypothetical business one that I've definitely not come across in the last 20 years, but we'll go with that as an example, and then we'll, we'll, we'll do a futsal example. So um, this, this is an example where the KPI that was chosen it created the wrong behaviours. So if you can imagine one big company and that company has three depots, so you've got manager A, manager B and manager C. So this company hires out things so you can see this is all the stock that they've got and they're in the business of hiring that out and at the end of every month each manager is assessed on their utilisation. How much stock have you still got on your shelf at the end of the month? And the idea is everything is out and everything's been hired. And if you're fully utilised, that's great, you get a big bonus. If you've got stock on your shelf, you're clearly not very good. So on the face of it, that's, that's a good KPI, that's a good thing to strive for. However, if manager A and manager B, if they know which day the KPI is being measured on, let's say it's the last Friday of the month, they put all their parts into a van each and they interlocate it on that same day, this stock is not on their shelf on the day that the KPI is being measured. So clearly these guys do very well in the stats and in their KPI. Whereas this guy over here, he's got an honest lot of stuff on his shelf still. So if we believe the KPI, these guys get their monthly bonus. We can throw in employee of the month for this person. And clearly this guy is, is not performing. We need to boot him out. So that for me is an example of the KPI driving the wrong behaviour. So um, to bring that back to futsal, because it's important that we're, that we're specific here. Um, if in real time in a game, stats were collected on how many times players lost the ball, that itself could have quite a toxic effect on, on the behaviour of the team. So this line, I've made it anonymous, but this is real data. So on the face of it, this player here, I've highlighted, this is the ball lost in the game and the third in which it was lost in. This player is doing pretty well. Not lost the ball in their own third, lost it once in the middle third, 
and lost it once in, in the final third. So that, that's not bad. However, and this is important why we have to look in context, we, we need to look through multiple lenses at a game. If we look in this column here, this is, this is the packing metric which we'll come on to. So that same player, if we only looked at this stat, is never losing the ball. However, I would suggest that that player is only playing sideways and backwards passes. They're not going to take any risks whatsoever in the game because they know that they're being measured solely on how many times they lose the ball. So they have no incentive to play forward passes that are more risky. So, and this is real data, that same player, in terms of their packing stat, comes in here at 2.7, while other more riskier players are racking up much bigger numbers here. So the point is we, we have to understand the context and we have to look at the stats through a number of different lenses to get, to get a fuller picture. So referring back to Doug's article, it's really important that we don't just dive in and believe anything we see, else we have this problem where we see this player's stats and we think that's one of the best players. That said, what stats will help us with it can save us from confirmation bias and I'm fed up for the last few years of hearing how many times player D has made a mistake um, and that's purely down to confirmation bias. When you look at the statistics that player is no different, no different to any other player in the team in terms of mistakes and where other players are allowed to get away with it or they're just being adventurous whenever this player makes a mistake it's because he's always making mistakes so that's one of the benefits of stats we can actually start to start to firm up people's subjective opinions and i'm guilty of it myself um, confirmation bias it helps us try and mitigate for that so um this 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 book was really good in terms of in terms of packing um this is what introduced me to the idea it was it was an airport book i picked up um by a guy called Christoph Diemann. I experimented with it since last summer. Um, tried a few different things. There's, there's an article here, it's a really old article now, and that was, that was my initial thoughts about it and how we could apply it. It's probably guilty of trying to do too many things with it and we'll come on to scope shortly. Um, but yeah, I've experimented with it since last summer, kept a few bits, dropped a few other bits that, that were just too difficult to do in a timely fashion. And so yeah, so, so packing. Packing was invented, as it were, by, by two German footballers from the Bundesliga, um, Stefan Reinhardt and Jens Hegler. And they felt that they were doing all the hard work and not getting recognised in the stats. So <laughs> they, they invented their own stats that they thought rewarded players that were, that were almost the engine, the engine of the team. Now, as is often the way with these things, it was misunderstood by the media and ridiculed by the press. Um, one of the rival German channels um, came up with, with their own flippant um, measure. They just called goaling. That was all the red bit. They called it goaling and they basically said, you count the number of goals, there's a 100% success rate and the team with the most goals wins the game. Um, and that kind of killed it dead in Germany. Um, it was more of a laughing stock, the, the, the packing metric, but purely down to the fact that it was never explained properly. So I think the best thing to do is if we if we have a look at some examples about what packing actually is. So you can see here as this pass goes in we need to count the number of players that have been bypassed by that pass. So just to subdivide this a little bit further, that's an example of earning packing points in possession. So this is the pass. So another example there of Jared earning packing points in possession. 
Now, the interesting thing, and we'll, we'll come on to the detail of it, when we drill into the data, it's not just a case of earning them by passing. It's, it's really interesting how the players profile. <laughs> I've just seen Jared's message. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Uh, you can pay me later. Um, yeah, it, it, it's really important to look at how players actually accrue these points. And players profile really differently. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come on to this. But this, this example, this is number 10, Totti. He earns his, as you can see here, you can, you can accrue them by 1v1s. On the flip side as well, you can actually lose points in possession. So let's look at this example. So as that pass goes in, which is intercepted, and that looks like Matty. As it's intercepted, the two players here are actually out of the game there. So that player would lose two points. This is another negative packing points example. So you can see as this pass goes in, these players are now out of the game, these two. This one, oh, this one bugs me every time I watch it. So the, the, the background to this was it was a county futsal game last summer. And this was the brother of a trialist. Um, so we'll, we're not going to go off at a tangent about anything technical because it's, it's awful. Um, but he pretty much takes all his team out of the game. So that's probably an example of how you can lose the most amount of points in possession. And the final example, you could say it's unfortunate or you could say the move needs to be finished. So this is Ivan Albeol uh, last year. It takes a shot, it rebounds off, but effectively lots of his teammates are out of the game now. So some examples there of how you can earn packing points in possession and how you can lose them in possession. If we look at this column here, this is the final example. And this is an example of how you can lose points out of possession. This is another particularly galling one. It's Cambridge with a, with a scripted kick-in, which this pretty much takes out the entire team. Okay, so before we, before we carry on with the rest of it, I'm going to catch up with a few questions, but that was hopefully to set the scene, um, and we can give it a little bit more context as we're going forward. So JK's got a question, uh, how do you weight your different lenses, what prioritises one over another and how would you do this numerically? Um, I'll come on to that actually in this, this next slide, the analysis process, in terms of which one do we use. So Ben showed you yesterday um, something that looked like this. This is the individual player analysis which sits here, so all the action variables go up to the player ratings here. The packing metric sits alongside that and it's just another way of looking at things and what Ben and I have historically done is Ben has ran with the player rating and worked on that. I've looked at the packing metric and then between the two of us we've, we've compared notes. If I scroll back to the, the earlier example, that's where this came in. So Ben would produce these stats here and I would produce these stats here. And then we could chew the fat over whether this player has actually had a good game or not so good a game. So in terms of where, where does packing fit into the greater universe, it's, it's just one particular performance indicator. So hopefully that answers that question. So if we, if we take a step back then, these are the individual player stats, uh, the player ratings that, that ben, ben produces. This is where it gets interesting now, hopefully. This is an aggregated view of player and team totals in terms of their packing stats. And, and what this is specifically, though, we're only counting the positive points. My, my feeling with, with past teams was that some of the stats were always looking to find out what players had done wrong. And I think in terms of the psychological corner, it was important to also say to the players, these are the good things that you've done. Also, if we only ever look at the positive uh, packing points in possession, 
that actually rewards the risk takers and it looks at players that are actually trying to make things happen. This was uh, Pro Futsal versus Alvesio from 17th of November. And I was, yeah, I, I was interested in um, going through the entire game and almost, this is only one, one match, uh, I have to add, we need more data. But I wanted to just see how the players profiled in terms of the positive packing points that they got. So um, this would generally be the first quartet and this would be the second quartet. These totals on the end, um, these are the team's overall um, packing points. These are the number of times it's occurred and we can, we can do some interesting things and players profile very differently. Um, so we'll, I'll come on to some examples of that a little bit later. Right, so, so in terms of, I want to relate this back to the initial um, book. So Christoph Biermann covered the packing stat um, in this book here, but it's, it was not a manual. It was, it was more an overview of interviews he'd done with Reinhardt and Hegeler to find out what they were doing. So I kind of did what I often do in, in my day job. I, I, I had a rough idea of how it might work and I just kind of ran with it, um, applied it to futsal and used a bit of intuition to just try and get something out of it. Um, and this is not me saying how this should be done. This is me putting it out there where I'm up to with it. I want to throw it out there to the wider, the wider community. So if we can get something, some dialogue going between us, um, to develop this, that, that would be really good. So it's my second guess of what I think that these two guys are doing in the context of German football, but applied to futsal. So I alluded to it with, with the examples earlier, stages of the game, there's nuances to this, but so long as we can agree that there are stages of the game and we'll go with um, just simple in possession, out of possession, um, not even so much positive, negative transition at the moment. But the main division in packing is between in possession and out of possession. Um, and this also comes on to the scope, which I'll, which I'll cover. Um, it's, not, it's not practical in, in any given game week to throw the kitchen sink at this. So if we, if we look at the entire universe, it's not practical in a week to cover everything. It's not even practical to cover all the different packing metrics that we can have. Um, so what, I, what I've typically done in a week is just focus on positive packing, um, that's all. Um, and as I said, that's, that's good in that it's psychologically it's good for the players, um, but we have to again understand that it's only the positive packing points, um, we're, not, we're not measuring negative ones at this point. What it does do is pick out potential threats in opposition teams. So. In the Helvetia example earlier, um, Tobias Sito was a real standout player in that second quartet. It does identify potential threats in the opposition. So Alex Agaza, who's now at Bolton, Alex actually racks up lots of packing points, lots of positive points, um, also racks up negative points, but it would be unwise to net those figures together. If he earns 20 positive points and then loses 20 from intercepted passes, we can't just look at a figure of zero and say he has no impact, because he clearly does. And if any of Alex's passes do get through, that could undo the team. So we, we, we clearly have to appreciate that. I spoke about the method of how, how the points were earned. So um, Jared and number 10, uh, Totti for Halvesio, they earn their points in very different ways to most players. Um, so they'll generally wrap them up, not exclusively, but they'll get more 1v1 pipe points. Um, also, if we look at the mean figure is, is interesting. So this player here, his mean positive packing figure is 2.3, um, compared with this figure, only 1.3. So this player is, is he's only having nine positive packing events um, in the game. But when he does do something, he's generally taken out over two opponents with every event. Whereas this player racks up lots of, lots of events and is generally taken out one player. So these, these are interesting signatures. And so long as they're taken in context, they, they can help to profile players. And, and I firmly believe that, that players and teams 
will all have their own signature when we look at this. Well, I want to just talk about the standardized figure down here just just really quickly. So these are the total pitch times that all the players have. Um, clearly we can't just look at the player that's had eight minutes and directly compare him with a player that's had 24 minutes. 24 is three times eight so you would expect this player to have three times the absolute value as this player. So these, these values here have been standardized as if the player had played 20 minutes. Um, it's also important that we do it for 20 minutes, for the first half, for the second half, and for the entire game. Um, I'll come on to Doug's stats a bit later, and I'll, I'll show you why. Just to keep track with the question, so Paul Hegarty, uh, packing points are signed only to pass giver or pass receiver. That's a really good point. It happens in pairs, so uh, it should be to both. Although there was an example there in Alex's where, I think it was the first example, if this was the case, I would award, so the player playing the pass, Alex, I would actually award him that one, even though it wasn't fully received. Again, it comes down, it comes down to scope. So in, in any given week, it might be a case of um, just tallying up the, the actual person making the pass. It comes down to how many people and how much time you've got looking at this. Uh, but yeah, good question, because it, it, yeah, ideally it has to be received. We can't just, we can't just bang balls in long and then claim that we've claim that we've got packing points. Next question from Jamie. Um, how do you define bypassing and out of the game? That's a really good question, yeah. So again, I said that there's a bit of subjective evaluation on my part on this. So there was an example where number 10, Totti from Helvetia, he, he came inside with his uh, 1v1 and took two players out of the game. So that was more lateral. So yeah, I would definitely give him two points there because he's still taking the players out of the game. Um, even though it wasn't just a case of going end to end, up and down. So yeah, a sideways pass, if it takes players out of the game, then yeah, definitely they get the points. Hopefully, Jamie, that's answered that question. This slide then, Tobias Sito. So, so we, we had a look at some of his stats earlier. My feel is that by looking at positive packing in possession, you find out which players are going to make things happen for a team. So I would suggest that in this second quartet here, given Tobias Sito's rating here, you need to keep an eye on him, you need to cut him out of the game, stop those passes getting through. And we've already spoken about um, different profiles within players. So the purple, purple areas here are where players have earned packing points through 1v1s as opposed to passing. And what's, what I thought was really interesting here, so just using, using Helbessia as a case study, so in the first half, um, number three didn't earn a lot of points in the first half just got one point here for a pass he made start of the second half he was racking up points here in 1v1s I would second guess that at half time he was asked to go for it with his 1v1s because he's, yeah, he's racking them up here this is a totally different profile for the same player as in the first half these are the actual individual events here that make up the, the overall stats that we see here. So this big figure here is made up of all of these individual stats. So Totti for Helvetia, you can see in the first half here, and he's got a plus two here, plus two here, plus one. He's racking these points up with 1v1s. It's not that he can only do 1v1s, he didn't do any in the second half, and he racked up loads of points in the second half with his passes, including the one right at the end, plus four. So, uh, I've spoken a little bit about this standardised figure and it's, it's really important to standardise them. So how do we go about that? Well, clearly we need to, and this, this is all in the public domain because the, the, the game footage is out there. So if you watch the game through, you can actually note down the, the sub patterns. If you note down the sub patterns, you can work out all the pitch time. If if the clock is on the screen, it's easy. Um, if it's not, you just have to get a bit more creative. So for this game, I just had to use the real time clock and then um, interpolate. But this is this is looking at, and, and maybe this is a subject for another day. This is looking at the quartets that we're on at any one given time, from which we can work out how long players have been on for. Uh, but it also tells us a lot. I mean, and, and I'm not going to go off at a tangent. 
um, these are the these are the events in the game. So this was this, the red dotted lines are Helvetia goals, and the blue dotted lines are Pro Futsal goals. So it's interesting to see um, who was on the court. I'll come on to plus minus a bit later because I hate plus minus. Um, but yeah, this this is the input from which we can get the standardised measures here. I did say I would look at, I would explain why this is standardised to 20 and not standardised to 40. Um, and that's something I've changed relatively recently. There's, there's lots of early morning and late night texts between myself and Ben discussing <laughs> stuff like this. So we felt that um, if you standardise it to 20 minutes, so this assumes that every player played the game for 20 minutes as does the first half figures and as do the second half figures. But what that does, it means that we can directly compare the player's first half and the second half with their overall performance. So I, I, I did say I'd mention Doug's figures. So this would suggest to me that purely in terms of positive packing points, Doug had a far more effective second half, 19.7, than he did with the first half. And his overall match is 11.1. .1. And that's despite him playing different pitch times because these are standardised figures. So it allows us to look at one half in context of, of the overall game as well, without having to double the figures. What's, what's also really interesting, and this is, this is something I've been really keen to do this last few weeks, baseline the figures. So how does one team compare against another team? Now, this is full of problems, and we'll, we'll come on to that. So clearly it all depends on the strength of the opposition, so you need big data sets. But what I did here was, this was this was the Helvetia players, and these are the positive packing points that they got playing pro futsal. And this is another team that's, um, this is their standardised figures playing pro futsal. So this is two different teams, um, direct comparison. How did the players do? You can see there's a few standout players here relative to their peers. It's a small data set. Again, I need to expand this this data, but these are the questions we can start to answer. And the more data, the more reliable this kind of stuff will be. What I want to finish with is, and I've mentioned this throughout, hopefully, is it's so important to, to understand the stats in context. We can't just look at a stat. Um, for instance, we can't just look at this stat and say 2.5 is rubbish. We have to understand it in context. So first of all, team totals, uh, a higher number is not necessarily better. So if we think that this is about the number of players in the opposition that have been taken out of the game by a pass or by a 1v1, the teams that will generally get the highest amount of points, if I was trying to game the system, coming back to understanding the rules and then trying to get the biggest possible score, I would set my team up to defend deep um, and then build possession. If, if we were a high pressing team and um, looking for positive transitions high up the court, we would earn less packing points. So this, this comes back to my point that I think each team will generally have a different signature here. So a, a higher figure is not necessarily better in the context of a team. Also, in, in terms of individual players, um, if a player has been told to win the ball high up the court, that player is not going to get as many packing points as a team that's defending deep and trying to thread balls through. Um, so everything has to be in context. What is really important is to understand the roles, the positions, the systems that are being played. Um, you cannot compare different positions. So for instance, you cannot compare a pivot with non-pivots. Um, totally different roles in the game. Um, so here, Rowney's example 7.1. It would be ridiculous to say, well, 7.1 is a third of this figure here, so it's a third of the player. Totally different role, so it's so important to understand the context. Um, coming back to the question earlier about passer and receiver, a far better measure of pivots would be, so for instance, we could argue that, okay, the pivot's going to be um, perhaps playing as a false pivot, going out wide to receive it. Maybe we should be measuring the pivots on packing points from, from what they're actually receiving. This was an earlier one I did last summer when I was throwing the kitchen sink at this. So this, these again are real figures. Um, these are the points that different players 
earned by actually being on the end of that, that pass that was threaded through. Um, and again, players profile so differently. So look at this player. Um, he's only earned two points in the whole game in terms of um, passes made. But clearly, if, if that's a player that's receiving 10 points worth of data, he needs to be in the team. So it would be it would be wrong to solely base any decisions on just this column here. Um, I've already mentioned this. Um, it's <laughs> it's so important to take the strength of the opposition into account. Um, that is a massive uh, a massive factor. And the example I showed you here, even this this is only on one game, so that's not that's not a great data set. But at least it was done against the same opposition. So with a pinch of salt, you could directly compare these players and these players. Um, I, I did say um, I hated plus minus. I've used this example. So large data sets, you have to have larger data sets. The larger, the better to, to make any meaningful conclusions. Um, plus minus, I absolutely hate this with a vengeance. Um, if it was a sport like basketball, where there's, where there's lots and lots of um, events happening, Lots of points being scored. The data set itself is much bigger, but with futsal, um, there's there's less goals scored. So you, you have to have seasons upon seasons worth of plus minus to make it meaningful. Um, so um, just taking a step back, you would get a plus one if you're on the court when a goal goes. When you score a goal, when your team scores, you get a minus one if you're on when you concede a goal. Um, I hate this one with a vengeance. You need hundreds of matches. Um, not useful on its own. Let me just have a look at some of the questions. Um, do you have any way you can look at players who create the possibility for the pass with their movement? Um, at the moment, I've not looked at it, but that's that's a really good question. And, and what I would say is there's lots of very influential players that fall between the cracks, and that's, that is one of the big dangers of statistics. Um, players may be doing things that go unnoticed by the stats and I think Doug's article was, was really good on that um, we can only measure a finite amount of things so that's something that's it's going to be far more difficult to capture but to get a fuller picture we have to capture that and, and, and again that might be something where we say we haven't got a reliable way of doing it we do need to rely on the coach's eye for that which is um, double tech approach or where you, you get your coach's eye and you get the statistics and you put the two together um, to come up with more informed opinions without relying on one or the other exclusively. So hopefully, I've rattled on for about 45 minutes. Um, this, is, this, is where, this is where the packing metric fits in to the overall universe of things that Ben spoke about yesterday. This is just looking within, pa within the packing metric, just looking at positive packing points in possession. Clearly, we could look at out of possession and we could look at negative points as well. So this is just a tiny corner of the packing metric. And again, it's, it's, it's me second guessing what I think the guys have done based on reading, um, reading Christoph Beerman's book. But hopefully that, that kind of shows where it fits in. Um, the challenge is how much can we actually get done in a given game week? Uh, ben and I do a lot early morning and late night on, on, on game weeks. I think the key with this is throwing it out there, getting lots of opinions in. I, I had a coffee with Doug Reed last summer, and Doug was really good. Lots of really practical questions. So if you've got a compact defence, just because the ball goes down the side doesn't necessarily mean that players should accrue packing points because that might be acceptable. There has to be some subjectivity at the moment. We can't just throw it open to machine learning at the moment. I still think it needs a coach's eye while we're noting down those packing points. So with that, hopefully, hopefully that gave an overview of, of, of packing.